Welcome to Immigrates, the podcast that highlights stories of immigrants making great contributions in their adopted countries. My name is Munati Manyande, and I'm your host. I was born and raised in Zimbabwe, and now live in Texas, USA, with my family. The last couple of uh, podcast episodes I've done, I've talked about how I felt like they needed to be turned into movies. Well, this week I get to tell a story that's already a Disney movie, but I believe can be made into a, a movie for broader audiences, for adults and for everybody in the world to get inspiration. I'll start by saying last year when my son Rodero was getting ready for his basketball season, he needed a new pair of basketball shoes. And when his mom asked him what shoes he wanted, his response was that he wanted a pair of Yanis shoes. And it was the first time that I actually learned that uh, this basketball player named Giannis Atentacumpo had his own Nike signature shoe. I mean, he's been a superstar for a while. He's uh, won a couple of uh, NBA Most Valuable Player trophies, but I actually had no idea that he had his own signature shoes. And the fact that my son, Rodero, specifically was requesting a pair of Giannis shoes caught my attention. So he got those shoes and, and he loves them to this day. And last night, I flew back home from a, from a trip that took me into Mexico this past week. And on my flight back to the Dallas area, one of the little boys that sat close to me on the plane happened to also be wearing a pair of Giannis Nike shoes. That was fascinating to me. Maybe he was seven years old. He's a white American boy who was there with his family. And you could also tell that he liked his shoes and, and loved how they made him feel. And so that got me excited as I'd been prepping for the last week and a half to do this recording and tell the story of Yanis Atentacumpo. So I'll get into it now. Yanis Atentacumpo is a Greek basketball player who's lived in America and played in the National Basketball Association since around 2013. Yanis himself was born in 1994 in uh, Athens, Greece, born to Nigerian immigrant parents. And I'll tell you, there are not many stories, many biographies that I've come across that have made me tear up as I've been reading on a very regular basis. It feels like in, this, in his life story, this biography I, I read, that Yanis, that every chapter about Yanis' life in this book made me tear up, made me emotional, uh, took me to places, some of my own memories of, of, of my growing up and also my experiences uh, as a young immigrant in the United States when I first came to go to university and so on. It's an incredible, incredible story that I, I really hope you'll take some time to, to, to go and check out. It's that powerful. So Yanis was born in Greece, like I said, in the mid-90s. His parents had left Nigeria in 1991. You'll notice that his, uh, his last name, Atentacumpo, does not sound very Nigerian. And the reason for that is that uh, Yanis' family name is actually Adetokumbo, which sounds a lot more Nigerian to me for sure. But because he was born in Greece and grew up in Greece, uh, when he finally got uh, a Greek passport, his last name, his family name, was rewritten to sound more Greek uh, by the authorities. And so he's gone by Yanis Atentacumpo since that happened. And this was just before he moved to the United States to play in the NBA. But his parents are 100% Nigerian. His father actually was a professional soccer player in Nigeria who moved with his wife to Germany with the plan of actually playing professionally in, in Germany. And unfortunately, he suffered a career-ending injury uh, shortly after moving to Germany that left for him without any options that had to do with sport. And because of the situation uh, back in uh, Nigeria, he and his wife decided that they were going to try to stay in Europe, and they ended up moving to Greece. They found odd jobs in Greece, thought they'd be able to find permanent immigration status while in Greece, uh, and it turned out to not be as simple as that. And so Yanis' parents were undocumented immigrants in Greece for 25, 30 years almost. Yanis is the third of five brothers. His oldest brother, whose name is Francis, I believe, was born and raised in Nigeria. In fact, when his parents left to move to Europe, they left Francis with his grandparents with the hope that once they'd settled in, in Europe, they'd be able to go and get him and bring him or send for him. And unfortunately, uh, because of the immigration challenges that they faced as a family, uh, Francis actually grew up and lived into his adult life in Nigeria without seeing his parents and without seeing any of his younger siblings until all of them were fully grown. 
And uh, Giannis himself was born with three other brothers in Greece. And because their parents were undocumented immigrants, that also meant that Giannis and his brothers that were born in Greece were technically undocumented immigrants. So Greece is different from a place like the United States where any child that is born on American soil, regardless of the citizenship status of their parents, becomes an American citizen. In Greece and in many countries in the world today, just being born in a particular nation does not automatically grant you citizenship to that nation. And so Giannis grew up essentially undocumented and essentially stateless because of, uh, of, of those laws in, in Greece. Because Giannis, his father, was a, a soccer player who loved soccer, Giannis himself grew up as a young boy enjoying and loving soccer and with hopes and dreams of himself becoming a, a professional soccer player. In fact, he talks about how his favorite player growing up uh, was the Arsenal um, soccer star uh, Thierry Henry, who is one of the all-time greats for sure. And uh, I loved kind of trying to imagine Giannis as a soccer player today because Giannis is, is seven feet tall, so he's over 2.1 meters tall, which is very, very tall, and I'm not sure that you'd be a great football player or soccer player at that height. So I think basketball was always going to be the sport that made sense, but it, I still enjoyed kind of hearing about his soccer dreams and desires as a young kid. His mother was a very good a track and field athlete. She was a sprinter and a long jumper. And his father, obviously, really good soccer player. Both his parents were, were tall and, and, and above average uh, build for sure. But uh, Giannis has ended up being the tallest and biggest of all his siblings, even though they were all very tall people from a very tall family. Because they grew up in Greece, uh, Giannis and his family were part of the Greek Orthodox Church. And uh, Giannis himself was baptized in the Greek Orthodox, Orthodox Church. He grew up seeing himself as fully Greek. I went to schools in the Athens area, speaks fluent Greek, doesn't speak very much of any of his parents' Nigerian languages, and actually had to learn English uh, around the time that he was getting ready to move to the United States and continue to learn English when he first arrived. And so he's a true, true immigrant in every sense of, of the word. I mentioned at the beginning of this recording that I just came back from a, from a trip and uh, the reason I'd uh, taken this trip, gone with a number of colleagues from an organization called Dash Network, which is one of the, one of the many hats that I wear uh, professionally or from a career perspective. So I've served as the executive director of this organization called Dash Network for, for a number of years now. And what we do in Dash Network is help people that uh, end up in the United States who are going through the asylum process. Um, so they are seeking asylum from the U.S. government, uh, which is basically permission to stay permanently in the United States and be granted a path to American citizenship because of uh, situations and circumstances that are happening in their home countries that render it unsafe for them to return home anytime soon. So, for example, with the uh, war that's happening in Ukraine, the Russia-Ukraine war that's happening, there's, there's been a significant number of uh, Ukrainian and Russian citizens that have found their way to the United States and have petitioned the government for permission to, to, to stay in America permanently because their homes have been destroyed by war and it just isn't safe for them to return. And we've been watching what's been going on in Israel and, uh, and the West Bank and Gaza and uh, issues going on between Israelis and Palestinians. And unfortunately, that will likely lead to a wave of individuals, families from that region being dispersed from their home countries, uh, from their territories, and ending up in other countries, the United States included, uh, looking for asylum or a chance to, to start their lives over, essentially. And so this trip we'd taken, uh, we went to the southern Texas-Mexico border, actually uh, crossed over into Mexico uh, for a bit, and we're basically learning from other organizations that are at the border that, that receive immigrants that come through the southern border with the intention of seeking asylum in the United States. And so it's quite interesting to me that as I was processing the story of Yanis and learning about his and his family's immigration struggles, that Greece did not have a system to help people that came from outside, especially people that were coming from Africa and places like that, to be able to regularize their immigration you know, status. What that meant was for all of Yanis's life growing up in Greece, uh, his parents could never 
hold down regular jobs because they actually didn't have the papers. So they spent their lives working for kind of cash jobs and getting paid under the table or just just an unstable existence, uh, to be honest. In fact, Yannis tells stories about how tough it was for them growing up. A family in Greece, four boys plus their parents living sometimes in a one-bedroom apartment, sometimes two-bedroom apartment, sleeping on the floor, not having beds for a good chunk of their lives. And then when they did have a bed, Yanis talks about how all four of his brothers would sleep on one bed. In fact, Yanis talked about how when he first moved to America, he had a really hard time sleeping in a huge king-size bed by himself because it was that was a new experience to him and he'd been so used to uh, sleeping in, a, in smaller beds and always sleeping with his brothers. Now, in fact, when he came to America for the NBA draft, he, he was able to come with his older brother, Thanasis, and uh, it's really funny that they the scouts that brought them here uh, had got them two hotel rooms next to each other that, that they were staying in. And Yadis and Thanasis didn't understand why somebody would spend money to put them in two separate hotel rooms. And they ended up actually sleeping in the same hotel rooms, in the same hotel room, actually on the same bed, just because that's what they were used to. And so it's, a, it's just a fascinating story, a true rags to riches story. Yadis talks about how growing up in Greece, their family was always in a situation of food insecurity. He talks about eating one meal a day, sometimes not having any food to eat on certain days, and how it was quite common that his parents would be able to put together enough food for the four boys to eat, and then they would just sit and watch their kids eat and not eat for themselves. And sometimes I think his parents would make up stories about how I, I, I ate something while I was doing this uh, peace job I was doing uh, this afternoon, just to try to make their sons feel a little bit better. But the parents essentially would often go to bed hungry because there just wasn't enough food to go to go around, especially around the time that Yanis and his brothers were starting to become preteens and teenagers because of how teenagers' uh, appetites uh, can be. One of his coaches from Greece that, uh, that got to know him and his family quite a bit started to actually bring food to practice once he realized what was going on with Yanis' family and giving Yanis and his brother food to eat from his own house before practice. Uh, the first time that Yanis went to a, a medical doctor for a full physical in Greece. The blood work that was done came back showing very alarming liver test results. And uh, when, they, when the doctor explained to Yanis what was going on, it turned out that Yanis, his liver test results had essentially come out looking like the test results of a 70-year-old man who was basically an alcoholic. That's how bad Yanis' liver test results were. And it turns out that was because he just was severely malnourished, wasn't eating enough, wasn't eating, getting the kind of nutrition that he needed. And so that had his body in a permanent state of stress. When he moved to the NBA, and one of the reasons why he wasn't drafted as high as he should have, obviously, was that he was so skinny, so scrawny, that it didn't really look like he would be able to pick up or gain weight. So he didn't look like very much. He just looked like a tall, skinny, uh, uncoordinated kid. And a lot of it was because of the nutrition. Obviously, if you've seen Giannis play, if you've seen him today, or if you look him up now online and see what he looks like, I mean, he's, he's a seven-foot, broad-shouldered, very muscled man, very strong. Looks nothing like he looked when he first arrived in the U.S. Uh, 10 years ago. But the concerns at the time by scouts and, and, and professionals was that, is he going to be able to gain weight if he... If he continues to be this skinny, he's going to be pushed around and knocked around by these big, strong guys in the NBA and so on. But of course, the team that drafted him, the Milwaukee Bucks, are extremely happy that uh, they were able to get him. And the NBA season in America actually starts this coming week, I believe on Tuesday. And one of the big headline stories from the NBA offseason is how Giannis's team, the Milwaukee Bucks, just traded recently for Damian Lillard from uh, who was who played with Portland. And so Giannis and Damian Lillard are on the same team today. Um, so they are now one of the big favorites to win the NBA championship this year. I know my my sons at home are extremely excited about about that combination and everybody's talking about Dame time and Giannis and it should be a fun uh, NBA season to to watch and I, I certainly will be rooting for Giannis to to some degree because because of his story and just the the really cool things that I learned about him. Something that seems to be common as I learn about these immigrants that are doing great things is the amount of racism 
that they've had to navigate and encounter growing up in, in these foreign lands. Giannis' story is no different. As a kid, it was common for people to call him Blackie in Greek and call him and his brothers Blackie. But as he started to play basketball, opposing fans would call him and his brother monkeys that make monkey noises as they were playing. As they, when they were close to them on the court, fans would throw cans and drink cans and bottles onto the court specifically aiming for Giannis and his brother. And Giannis grew up at a time where in Greece, much like a lot of Europe, this right-wing nationalist, almost uh, fascist, Nazi-type uh, movement was brewing. And so there were a lot of instances where people were saying things in the media about Giannis and his family and saying things to their faces too as they're growing up. Once he became an NBA star, there were a lot of people that were not happy that Giannis was being called Greek, was being treated as 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 a Greek citizen because these right-wingers, far-right-wingers, these racists would go on the record to say it is not possible for a person who is black to be called Greek. There's only a certain, you've got to look a certain way to be Greek. You can't look like a monkey and be Greek and things like that. So he's had to endure those those very difficult situations as a young kid, but even as an adult. Uh, now that he's a Greek citizen and plays for the Greek national team, uh, he's a superstar that's beloved, but there's still many people that don't like that he's called Greek. He has, in the neighborhood he grew up in, the basketball court, the community basketball court he grew up playing on has been named after him, and there have been some really neat murals that have been painted outside of it, and they've been defaced with people um, painting swastikas over his face and things like that. Go back to your country, go back monkey, go back to the jungle. Those types of statements being written and being leveled at him and his family, which is really unfortunate. And that seems to be a common thread for a lot of uh, the immigrants I've been learning about, especially, obviously, those that are not white that end up moving to predominantly white uh, countries. And so Yadis had to endure that. He had to live in a society where he did the same things that other Greek boys did. In the biography I was reading, the biographer got to interview a number of Yanis's teammates growing up, and they were talking about how bad it was for Yanis and just how he would never respond, never react, and just act like he well, he could didn't hear anything. He and he never wanted to talk about it uh, off the basketball court. But they definitely talk about how tough it was. Even though he and his brothers, together with their teammates, like other Greek kids, would go and look for ways to make a little bit of money. They talk about how there's a Greek tradition where young kids go to shopping malls and to rich neighborhoods around Christmas and sing Christmas carols in those neighborhoods. And they actually get money for doing that and kind of promoting this Christmas spirit. And uh, Giannis, apparently, in, when he was 11 years old, did the caroling so well and took it so seriously that he, he'd leave home before 6 in the morning and come back at 8 o'clock at night, just singing and getting as much money as he could. And at that Christmas, when he was 11, Giannis was actually able to buy the family's first ever television and a PlayStation from the 800 euros that he earned from the caroling. Giannis would sometimes spend time with his mom on the streets trying to sell sunglasses for two or three euros each. They would go to some of the tourist spots in Greece, the beaches, and try to just find stuff that they could sell. And it was always whatever money we made that day is what mom would use to buy food for, for the family's dinner that night. And so if they didn't sell anything, they'd get home and just get into bed and, and go to sleep without eating. So just really tough situations that they endured. Yanis, because of what they went through and how they had to stick together, uh, Yanis is extremely close to his family and that's the most important. His family and his well-being and him being able to, to help his family just live better lives and get out of the stateless immigrant position that they're in led to Yanis making some, some pretty extreme decisions. Before he got a chance to come to the U.S. to play in the NBA, Yanis was offered a contract with up to $650,000 uh, to go and play basketball in Spain. And he tore that contract up and refused it when he found out that the, the team in Spain that wanted him was not willing to, they were willing to help try to find an immigration solution for him, but they weren't willing to do the same for his brothers and his parents. And because of that, he tore up the contract and started crying in this negotiation and says, look, I'm not moving, I'm not doing anything without my family. Giannis was finally granted citizenship in uh, May 2013, Greek citizenship in May 2013. And uh, that was, he was about 18 years old at that point, just before he came to the U.S. for the NBA draft. 
In fact, he was granted the citizenship because of that. The, the story reads to say that the Greek government and a lot of others who started to kind of realize that Yanis had potential to become a star suddenly wanted to claim him as, 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 as one of their own after they'd refused to help him out for, for so long. Yanis at age 18 did not have a Greek passport. Uh, he did not even have an, a Nigerian passport or anything like that, had no form of identification. He, he or his family have never had never owned a bank account uh, in Greece because of the immigration situation. And uh, the Greek government scrambled and gave him and his brother citizenship in 2013. And uh, when he moved over to America, one of the first things he said to the Milwaukee Bucks when they drafted him was that, Hey, I'll come, but I need you guys to help me help my get my family over here because I'm not going to be okay if I'm separated from my family. And so the Milwaukee Bucks agreed to help him out. And uh, once he moved here, they started the process to bring the rest of his family here, which was a long, not easy process. In fact, they were den- his family were denied visas by the American embassy in Greece several times. And the Milwaukee Bucks had to use lawyers and just find ways to, uh, to make it happen. In fact, around the time that Yanis was granted Greek citizenship, uh, he and his family had actually reached out to the Nigerian embassy um, to try to see if Yanis could get a Nigerian passport that would allow him to come to the United States for the NBA draft. And in fact, that's around the time that the believe that Greek officials caught wind of that plan and they felt like if Yanis ended up playing as a Nigerian in the NBA, uh, that it would be a bad look on them. And so that pushed them to, to hurry up and give him Greek citizenship. His uh, mother and younger brothers didn't, uh, wouldn't get Greek citizenship for another 10 years. Uh, so they just got Greek citizenship in the last couple of years. And again, that's been something that's been talked about, how it, now it feels like the Greek government wants to claim them because of Yanis's uh, basketball prowess. And also because Yanis has uh, obviously continued to be loyal to Greece and to the you know, Greek citizens and continues to identify as Greek and has played basketball for Greece and wants to win an Olympic gold medal for Greece and, and, and things like that. It's fascinating. When Giannis moved to the United States to start playing for the Milwaukee Bucks, he couldn't, he couldn't believe how lavish the NBA team, but the NBA in general, would spend on NBA players. He couldn't understand why the franchise was spending money on limos to get him around why they were staying in five-star hotels. Um, In fact, the first hotel that he lived in before he found an apartment for himself in Milwaukee, uh, Giannis actually struggled sleeping on the bed. So he ended up uh, taking the mattress off the bed and putting it on the floor and sleeping on the mattress on the floor in in this five-star hotel room because it just felt better. He just felt more comfortable. That's just how, it's an indication of where he was coming from as, as a young man and what he'd grown up accustomed to. Giannis is the superstar that has never gotten into the big fancy department stores, the big fancy grocery stores. Giannis loves to shop at Walmart here in the U.S. He furnished his first condo and apartment entirely through stuff he bought from Walmart. And uh, it tells a story of him just being blown away at how big Walmart is and running around the aisles like, like a child the first few times he was there. And that reminded me of my first time in in the U.S. as a college student, as an 18, 19-year-old university student, and moving to a town where we had just gotten our first Walmart super center. And I remember being fascinated at this massive supermarket where I could buy furniture, I could buy electronics, I could buy my groceries all in in that same store, fresh produce, I could buy bedding, I could also go and buy tires and get my new tires for my car, and they'd, they'd put them on the, t- on the car for me. They'd do my oil change for me. Being America, you can buy guns in that same store. And I remember just being blown away at the size of it and also kind of running through the aisles. I used to enjoy running through the aisles and kind of riding on the Walmart cart or trolley, as, uh, as, as we grew up calling them in Zimbabwe, and just kind of just being blown away at the American excessiveness from a, from a retail standpoint. And Giannis definitely experienced the same, that same feeling of being overwhelmed as, as I did. When he moved into his first condo, he got a three-bedroom condo, but wouldn't sleep in the master bedroom, even though he lived by himself. And when asked why, he said that was because he was saving the master bedroom for his parents, that when my parents finally move here from Greece, that's going to be their room. I'm not sleeping in their room. And so he slept in one of the smaller bedrooms. He was really tight with money coming from the extreme poverty and struggles, financial struggles he'd suffered to the extent that in his first couple of years in the NBA, apparently one of his friends went into his apartment to do something for him. 
and ended up opening a jar of Oreo cookies and helping himself to some Oreo cookies. And when Yanis came home later, he it turns out that Yanis had been counting his Oreo cookies and he noticed that his friend had eaten three cookies. And so the next day when he saw his friend at, at the team facility, Yanis actually asked him, hey, did you, did you grab some cookies from my jar? And so and this friend just thought it was crazy to him that Yanis would notice that somebody had had three Oreo cookies from a jar that had almost 30 cookies to begin with. He's always been really tight with money. In his first couple of years when he wasn't making the big, big money in the NBA, Giannis would always be broke because he'd get his paycheck and, and, and go straight to Western Union and send all the money to his, uh, his parents and his brothers in Greece and then just wait for his next paycheck. He didn't buy any clothes for himself. He was in the NBA and wearing one pair, the same pair of uh, basketball shoes for six months which is unheard of in America, where here the superstars in America wear a brand new pair of basketball shoes for every single game and even for practice. But Giannis just was, I'm not going to be wasteful. I'll, I'll wear these same shoes until, until they're in really bad shape and just continue to just send all his money to, to his family. And he was he made about a million dollars in his first year, but just by looking at him and talking to him, you would have never known at that point. Struggled really, really hard with uh, being lonely and missing his family in his first year. Um, and that really affected his, his, his game and progress. And things started to look up for him when he finally was able to get his family over here in the, in the U.S. Another story that cracked me up that I learned about is that Giannis, in his first year, refused to be paid his NBA paycheck by direct deposit into a bank account. He didn't want that. He wanted to actually go into the Bucks office and actually be given a physical check that he would take and cash himself, and then he would go and send money to his, his parents. And then for context, again, like I said, he was making about a million dollars that year. So you're talking about possibly thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 checks at some point that he was going to cash and then going to send money to, to his family. In fact, a really crazy story that I heard about Giannis um, a couple of years ago was that uh, when he first signed his, his first big contract, so he, which was the second contract with the Milwaukee Bucks, it was a $100 million contract extension. And when he got his signing bonus for that money, he'd found out. So those that live, that are, the listeners that live here in the United States, you know that the American banks, uh, bank accounts come with uh, deposit insurance. And so at the moment, every individual bank account that you hold in America uh, can is insured for up to $250,000, which basically means that if a particular bank uh, ends up going under, going insolvent because of mismanagement or whatever, and they have my money that's sitting in that bank account, the government, the federal government basically insures or guarantees that I'll get up to $250,000 back from each account that I hold with that particular bank. So when Yanis found this out, after signing a big contract, Giannis actually went and tried to open as many bank accounts as he could because he wanted to deposit a maximum of $250,000 in each account because he was so worried about something happening that would cause a bank, some banks to go under and he'd lose his money. And it sounds crazy when you live in America that somebody would be willing to do that. But what, what we have to realize is that Greece is a member of the U European Union, but Greece has gone through some very difficult economic times. And I know in the early 2000s, Greece as a nation basically went bankrupt uh, and there has been, was in shambles. They had to be bailed out by the European Union with very stringent requirements, financial requirements and things, hoops they had to go through to be able to continue to remain in the European Union banking framework. And so people in Greece have dealt with inflation and dealt with banks going under and not being able to access your money in the bank. And so Yadis, obviously, this would have been very influential on him as a young man, kind of seeing that going on around you. I can certainly relate to that because where I'm from in Zimbabwe, we've had our share of uh, economic disasters, hyperinflation, uh, banks going under and people having their assets and cash that sitting in banks that went under that basically got no recourse. We've had incidents in the past where even our central bank has raided individual bank or business bank accounts and taking that money and then either not paid it back or then tried to pay it back in the local currency using exchange rates that are prejudicial and, and just left people very disadvantaged. So I can understand this uh, feeling of I, can't, I, I cannot trust the banking system. I cannot trust the system. I want to do the things that I can to control my money and not let other people have an opportunity to, to make me go broke and, and so on. But it's still just kind of fascinating because that's a very different mentality than what's typical here in America. And in fact, most people 
thought that Giannis was crazy when uh, when when he was doing this and and when he was refusing to to spend money like like most superstars do. Giannis would eventually find his groove in the NBA when the Milwaukee Bucks hired a new coach, a coach named Jason Kidd, who was a basketball Hall of Famer himself, a superstar who won championships in his day, and an extremely, extremely sharp basketball mind. So he saw the potential that in Giannis, and he pushed to build a team around Giannis that would essentially allow Giannis to f- maximize his potential and flourish. And boy, did he flourish. Giannis would eventually become NBA MVP, like I said, in uh, 2019, and uh, he would eventually sign what's called an NBA Supermax contract. So his third contract that he signed is a, it was called a Supermax contract, and at that point, that was that was a contract that gave him an additional 200 million dollars in earnings. And so at this point in 2023, Giannis has earned almost 350 million dollars from the NBA. He now earns about 25 million dollars a year in endorsements from the different companies like Nike and and so on. Uh, he became an NBA champion in 2021 when he led the Milwaukee Bucks to to a championship. They played the Phoenix Suns in the uh, in the final series and uh, he was elated. I remember even seeing uh, the day after they won the championship, he went live on his Instagram just celebrating. He was driving around in his car with the NBA trophies on his lap. He went to Chick-fil-A to buy and bought 50 chicken minis because he just scored 50 points in the in the final game that won them the championship. And his innocence, his uh, his charm, he's just such a genuine genuine guy, just happy. He can't believe where he where he is in life right now. He definitely says he never saw it coming. He's just just done so just done so well. And I've really enjoyed learning about Giannis. And as I wrap up, some thoughts on Giannis and just his journey and where he's at now. There are many stories that I read about, situations that I read about that leave me feeling like, man, this could only happen in America. And Giannis' story definitely feels like one of those. I think Giannis def- definitely was good enough to be a, 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 a star basketball player in the Euro League, uh, but he would not have been the global phenomenon that he is today had he remained in Europe. He would have been comfortable financially, been able to look after his family playing in Europe, but he wouldn't have been one of the one of the world's wealthiest uh, sports stars if he wasn't if he hadn't moved to America if he you know, didn't have that global appeal. He's one of the NBA superstars that's beloved in America, maybe loved even more outside of America, and that's because of him being so true to his immigrant roots, true to his Greek roots, and true to his Nigerian roots. And uh, he's also just such an unassuming, lovable guy, somebody that tries really hard to be polite to people, uh, treat people with respect. But he's also got the ability of turning on kind of a killer mode or beast mode on the basketball court where he doesn't want to be your friend. He's willing, he wants to dominate you. He's willing to embarrass you on the basketball court. But once he's done, he seems like one of the nicest guys on the court. He was blown away when people like LeBron James would would, uh, compliment his game and talk about how he was coming and that they felt like he would be an MVP in the future. He'd be a a champion in the future. Just couldn't believe it. So he'd go from being a fan of a LeBron James and just kind of, I can't believe LeBron just said what he said and LeBron just just gave me props for my game to getting on the court and trying to score 50 points on LeBron and trying to uh, just destroy LeBron's team just because of the competitive fire that's that's in him. And so such a fascinating story. I've really enjoyed learning about uh, Giannis Atentacumbo. I've enjoyed telling the story. He's an immigrant who's made great impact on America and the global basketball scene at large. Such an inspiration, such a story of grit and determination. Please like this podcast and follow us on your podcast player to catch new episodes. Find us on social media under the name Immigrates and visit our website at immigrates.net and enter your email address to join the growing Immigrates community. Until next time, peace.